Welcome to the History of Computing podcast, where we explore the history of information technology. Because understanding the past prepares us to innovate and sometimes cope with the future. Today, we're going to talk about a name that just keeps coming up. The name Claude Shannon has come up eight times so far in this podcast, more than any single person. We covered George Boole and the concept that Boolean is a zero and a one, and that using Boolean algebra, you can abstract simple circuits into practically any higher level concept. And Boolean algebra had been used by a number of mathematicians to perform some pretty complex tasks, including by Lewis Carroll and through the looking glass to make words into math. And binary had effectively been used in Morse code to enable communications over the telegraph. But it was Claude Shannon who laid the foundation for making a theory that took both the concept of communicating over the telegraph and applying Boolean algebra to get to a higher level of communication. And it all starts with bits, which we can thank Shannon for. Shannon grew up in Gaylord, Michigan. His mother was a high school principal and his grandfather had been an inventor. He built a telegraph as a child using a barbed wire fence. But barbed wire isn't the greatest conducer of electricity and so, well, noise. And thus, information theory began to ruminate in his mind. He went off to the University of Michigan and got a bachelor's in electrical engineering and another in math. A perfect combination for laying the foundation of the future. And he got a job as a research assistant to Vannevar Bush, who wrote the seminal paper, As We May Think. At that time, Bush was working at MIT, on the thinking machine or differential analyzer. This was before World War II and they had no idea, but their work was about to reshape everything. At the time, what we think of as computers today were electromechanical. They had gears that were used for the more complicated tasks and switches used for simpler tasks. Shannon devoted his master's thesis to applying Boolean algebra thus getting rid of the wheels, which move slowly, and allowing the circuit or computer to go much faster. He broke down Boole's laws of thought into a manner it could be applied to parallel circuitry. That paper was called A Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits, and it was published in 1937 and helped set the stage for the hacker's revolution that came shortly thereafter at MIT. At Bush's urging, he got his PhD in biology, pushing genetics forward by theorizing that you could break the genetic code down into a matrix. The structure of DNA would be discovered by George Gamow in 1953, and Watson and Crick would discover the helix after Rosalind Franklin used X-ray crystallography to capture the first photo of the structure. So Shannon moved off to Princeton in 1940 to work at the Institute for Advanced Study, where he might be able to rub elbows with Einstein and von Neumann. He quickly moved over to the National Defense Research Committee as the world was moving towards World War II. A lot of computing at the time was going into making projectiles or bombs more accurate by applying math. He co-wrote a paper called Data Smoothing and Prediction in Fire Control Systems During the War. He'd gotten a primer in early cryptography, reading The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe as a kid. And it struck his fancy, so he started working on theories around cryptography. Everything he'd learned forming into a single theory. He would have lunch with people like Alan Turing during the war. And it was around this work that he first coined the term information theory in 1945. A universal theory of communication gnawed at him and formed during this time. From the Institute to the National Defense Research Committee to Bell Labs, where he got hired and helped encrypt communications between world leaders. He hid his theory from everyone for a decade. It included failed relationships. He broke information down into the smallest possible unit, 
the bit, which is short for binary digit. He worked out how to compress information that was most repetitive, similar to how Morse code compressed the number of taps on the electrical wire by making the most common letters the shortest to send. Eliminating redundant communications established what we now call compression. Today, we use the term lossless compression frequently in computing. He worked out that the minimum amount of information to send would be h equals negative sigma pi log 2 pi, or I guess as we'd call it, entropy. His paper, put out while he was at Bell, was called A Mathematical Theory of Communication and came out in 1948. You could now change any data to a 0 or a 1 and then compress it. Further, he had to find a way to calculate the maximum amount of information that could be sent over that communication channel before it became garbled due to loss. We now call this the Shannon limit. And so once we have that, he derived how to analyze information with math to correct for noise. That barbed wire fence could finally be useful. This would be used in all modern information connectivity. For example, when I took my Network Plus, we spent an inordinate amount of time learning about carrier sense multiple access with collision detection, or CSMA-CD, a media access control method that used carrier sensing to defer transmissions until no other stations are transmitting. And as his employer, Bell Labs helped shape the future of computing. Along with Unix, C, C++, the transistor, the laser, information theory is a less tangible yet, given what we all have in our pockets or on our wrists these days, more tangible discovery. Having mapped the limits, Bell started looking to reach the limit. And so the digital communication age was born when the first modem would come out of his former employer, Bell Labs, in 1958. And just across the way in Boston, ARPA would begin working on the first interface message processor in 1967, the humble beginnings of the internet. His work done, he went back to MIT. His theories were applied to all sorts of discipline, but he comes in less and less. Over time, we started placing bits on devices. We started retrieving those bits. We started compressing data, digital images, audio, and more. It would take 35 or so years for some of his theories to become reality. He consulted with the NSA on cryptography. In 1949, he published Communication Theory of Secrecy Systems, pushed cryptography to the next level. His paper, Prediction and Entropy of Printed English in 1951, practically created the field of natural language processing, which evolved into various branches of machine learning. He helped give us the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, used in aliasing, deriving maximum throughput, RGB, and of course, signal-to-noise ratios. He loved games. In 1941, he theorized the Shannon number, or the game tree complexity, of chess. In case you're curious, the reason Deep Blue can win at chess is that it can brute force 10 to the 120th power types of moves. His love of games continued, and in 1949, he presented Programming a Computer for Playing Chess as a paper. This was the first time he thought about computers playing chess, and he'd have a standing bet that a computer would beat a human grandmaster at chess by 2001. Gary Kasparov lost to Deep Blue in 97. That curiosity extended far beyond chess. He made Theseus in 1950 a maze with a mouse that learned how to escape using relays from phone switches, one of the earliest forms of machine learning. In 1961, he would co-invent the first wearable computer to help win games of roulette. That same year, he designed the Minivan 601 to help teach how computers work to people in business. He had a profound impact on computing. So, we'll leave you with this one last bit of information. Shannon's maxim is that the enemy knows the system. 
I used to just think it was a shortened version of Kirchhoff's principle, which is that it should be possible to understand a cryptographic system, for example, modern public key ciphers, but not be able to break the encryption without a private key. The thing is, the more I know about Shannon, the more I suspect that what he was really doing was giving the principle a broader meaning. So think about that as you try and decipher what is and what is not disinformation in such a noisy world. Lots and lots of people would carry on the great work in information theory, like kohlbach liebler's divergence or relative entropy, and we owe them all our thanks. But Shannon, here's the thing, math. He took things that could have easily been theorized, and he did theorize them, but he proved them mathematically because science can refute disinformation if you let it. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the History of Computing podcast. We are so, so lucky to have you. I hope you have a great day. 